Okay, hello everybody. Um, welcome to the next lecture video. Uh, there's a couple things we want to do today. I want to kind of um, just wrap up very quickly transitive closure, which we talked about in class on Monday. Then introduce a new problem on graphs, which is minimum spanning trees. And we'll look at one way of potentially solving that. And we'll see that that's an example and the first of many examples of the big topic for today is a new way of thinking about algorithm design, which is called greedy algorithms. So we're going to look at transitive closure, then look at this new problem called minimum spanning tree and see an example of a greedy algorithm for that. And then just say, like, what are the big pitfalls? What is greedy algorithm design all about? And then we'll have more examples of that going forward. So first about transitive closure, this is from Monday's class, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this, but um, the it's about the reachability question. So given a graph, we want to know for every pair of vertices whether you can reach one um, vertex from another one. And we saw that we can solve this with an all pair shortest path. Um, so that's what APSP is, all pair shortest path problem, um, like what we saw in the last lecture. And we can do that in n cubed time. So this is one way of solving transitive closures. You just find the shortest path to everywhere. And if the shortest path is not infinite, then that means that it must be reachable. But it seems like overkill, right? This seems maybe like um, it's doing a little bit too much work because we don't actually care for the transitive closure problem. We're just trying to answer reachability. We don't care about the very best way of getting there. We just want to know, if, is it possible? It's almost like the difference between running Dijkstra's algorithm, which is finding the shortest paths, or doing a, a depth first search, which is just saying, you know, can you get there? The depth first search will, will ultimately always find the same destination node. It just won't necessarily be the most efficient path to get to it. But if that's all you care about, then you would probably rather use a depth first search, which is going to have a better running time um, and be simpler because it can just use like a stack compared to Dijkstra's algorithm, which has to use a priority queue. So it's a similar kind of dichotomy here. Um, can we have an equivalent of like this depth first search idea, but for all pairs going in all directions? And the answer is kind of yes, but not with anything like depth first search. And it's a really surprising way that this works. That's the main reason I wanted to talk about it. And so what we use is Boolean matrix multiplication. Uh, so what you remember is that we create this matrix A is like an adjacency matrix, but we have one, um, if uh, it's on the diagonal, like a self connection, or if there's an edge for that in the graph, and zero for non edges. So A is a one zero matrix. It's really a Boolean matrix, like true or false. Then we can power this up. It turns out that A to the n minus one um, is going to be non zero or zero depending on whether uh, that thing is actually reachable. So a non-zero entry in this power of A computed with matrix multiplication means that you can reach um, one vertex from another. So each entry of this powered matrix tells us about that reachability query. So this a to the n minus one, or actually any higher power of a, will tell us um, the transitive closure problem. We'll solve that problem for us. And so the key to computing this quickly is we have to use um, square and multiply in order to do the powering. So that's an algorithm that we first saw in terms of the RSA algorithm, but it really helps with the exponent. So it means that instead of having to do n steps to compute this power, we only have to do like log n steps. And then we also use Strassen's or another fast multiplication matrix multiplication algorithm for the um, matrix matrix multiplications. And if we do both of those things, this turns out to run in um, in this case of using Strassen's, it's like n to the 2.81 times log n time. And this n to the 2.81 part can even be faster if you use a better 
um, more recent matrix ma matrix multiplication algorithm. We talked about Strassen's algorithm. We also mentioned that there's other things like um, the strassen winograd multiplication or more recent things by um, Williams and Legal and, and a bunch of actually like recent work from within the past few months. Um, so, or faster using um, a better algorithm for the matrix multiplication. And so why is this cool is it, it's an important problem. And it's also, I think, an interesting example of where we get to connect these algorithms from seemingly different topics and use them to solve something else, in this case, something about graphs. Uh, so that's, that's all I want to say about transitive closure, um, kind of connecting some, some ideas together here. And now let's skip ahead a little bit and let's talk about spanning trees. So it's going to be a different problem. Whoops. Um, here we go. This is the one I wanted to go to, spanning trees. So you can see I kind of skipped the topic on greedy algorithms here. We're going to go back to that. Um, so the spanning tree algorithm we're going to see is an example of a greedy algorithm. I wanted to show you the example first and then go back to the general idea. So here's a new problem. Um, you might have seen this problem before, maybe not. Uh, and anyway, we're going to see a few algorithms for this problem, uh, probably some things you haven't seen before, and think about, uh, again, our goal in this class is to think about what's the underlying idea behind these algorithms, how can we apply those ideas to solve new problems. Um, so for spanning trees, what the goal is, uh, so we want to connect a graph using the minimal amount of total weight on the edges. So like here's a graph with A, B, C, D, E, F. And we want to say, which edges can we pick so that everything gets connected and uh, the amount of edges are minimal? So one thing we could do is just pick every edge, right? So just pick every edge to be part of this. But that would be pretty dumb. Like there, clearly there's going to be some redundant edges here, like B to E. You know, we could cut that edge out. And now it's still just as connected because we could go through C. So that's that's um, just choosing every edge is something that would work, but it's not going to be most efficient. We could think of some other strategies. Like you might think here, like C is a central hub. So maybe we could just connect everything through C. Okay, so what would that do? Now you can see that everything is connected, meaning everything is reachable, right? Um, F and B aren't directly connected with an edge, but they're indirectly connected. So that's okay. That's our goal. And what's the total here is going to be uh, 6 plus 6 plus 5, so 17. Then uh, you might pause and say, is 17 the best possible in this case? Well, let's check out a different option. If we um, start with this one, and then we're going to um, connect this one right here, and then we'll connect to this one. So now we kind of have um, A, C, B, and E in a line, and then we'll connect to D with this length two edge, and we'll connect to F with this length two edge. And what do we get here is one plus one plus two plus one plus two, um, which is seven. So we can, our initial idea was just having C as the central hub and all those spokes that turned out to be terrible. Um, we can do much better. Uh, and in fact, seven is the minimal that we could we could have here. And one thing that you should notice is that both of these have the same number of edges. So if you count this up, the number of pink edges is one, two, three, four, five, in order to connect these six nodes. And in the green way, the first way with having C as the central um, kind of hub in these spokes, we also have one, two, three, four, five edges. And that's not a coincidence. Um, so it turns out that uh, there's a property, which we kind of hinted at in a previous uh, puzzle, which is that the least number of edges in any connected graph is always going to be n minus 1. So what you notice here is that both of the potential solutions we came up with both had n minus 1 edges. But of course, just having the minimum number of edges doesn't necessarily they're going to mean uh, going to mean that they're going to be the minimal weight. And so our challenge um, in this problem is to say, how can we have this minimally connected thing, um, but where we also have the least weight of the total weight of edges? And 
Um, and again, some ways that you might think of, of doing it, like this hub and spokes idea, are not always going to give the optimal solution. Some solutions are much better than other. In this case, if it's like you're trying to create a network, um, you're going to save your boss a lot of money by coming up with a second option that only uses seven feet of cables or whatever, miles, whatever you want to say. And so this is the problem, um, MST, that you'll see this abbreviation used quite a bit. So that stands for minimum spanning tree. Um, so the let's first of all talk about the tree part. So a tree is a connected graph with no cycles. We, we said that a tree is another way of saying like the, the least connected that a graph can be. So if you would add any extra edge, you would get a cycle. Um, and so that's, that's what a tree is. And it always has exactly n minus one edges. And we kind of explored previously and saw that if you have n nodes, the least number of edges to connect them is always gonna be n minus one. A spanning tree is a tree that includes all the vertices. So most of the trees that we would think of are spanning trees. So what's something that's, you know, what would not be spanning is if you have some things like this. And if I were to have, a, a, oh, that's too close. Sorry, if I have like these nodes and I have something like here, this is really two trees. They're not connected to each other. Um, so that's not, that's not what we want. We want a spanning tree, which means that somehow the whole thing has to be connected. So this picture that I have now is a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven node um, spanning tree. And a minimum spanning tree is of course what we just said, where we want it to not only be a spanning tree, so it should touch every node, it should have the least number of edges and the total weight of all those edges should be minimal. So that's the problem we were just looking at here. And that's the, that's the minimum spanning tree problem. So now we wanna think about how can we actually solve this? There's a couple ways to solve this. One of the cool things about this problem is that um, there's multiple ways of solving that you might you might kind of naturally think of, and they and they actually work, which isn't always the case. Let's let me uh, go back to this one and also mention something that um, doesn't work because we're thinking about these different like algorithm design strategies and what have we learned so far. Um, so one thing that doesn't work here is divide and conquer. You might think of divide and conquer as being a sensible idea. And, and the reason why I bring it up is because it's a good example of something that seems to make sense when we look at a picture. And then we have to remind ourselves that the pictures that we see of graphs can mislead us sometimes. We have to think back to what's that representation. So like if you wanted to do a divide and conquer algorithm for this, you might think of like, oh, let me just separate out and take these three nodes and these three nodes. I'll get a minimum spanning tree on each one, and then I'll connect them in the best way. That seems like a sensible idea, but actually this splitting up part, this blue line that I draw is called a cut in the graph. And you would need the cut to have certain properties in order to maintain the minimum spanning tree. And finding such a cut is itself actually a really hard and tough algorithmic problem. Um, so one of the things about graphs is that where we you don't usually see divide and conquer algorithms working really well is that unlike with arrays or even with matrices it's not obvious if you're given a graph list like an adjacency matrix how do i cut that graph in half how do i pick some edges to go here and some and some nodes to go over here it's it's not so easy as just saying take the first half of the nodes and the second half of the nodes because if i took like a b and c f would be over here by itself and d and e you know that wouldn't really make sense um so that's just to say divide and conquer uh, approaches are going to have a lot of trouble because you usually have to think about how to cut the graph and that itself is a hard problem. Um, so that doesn't seem to work, but there's some other ideas that I think are not too tough that, that actually do work well. Um, and so let me skip ahead to this algorithm. So I'm going to run Prim's algorithm and then we'll, we'll back up and see what the strategy was. So what I'm going to do is run through this algorithm step by step and then let you think about, as I'm doing this, I want you to think about what is the strategy that I'm using. So I'm going to start at this node right here and add edges into my spanning tree. So I'm looking around. Okay, this is the first edge that I'm going to add, this wait for edge right here. So now I have these two nodes and the edge between them in my tree. The next edge I'm going to add is this one of wait three. 
Okay, notice that I didn't start with the least weight edge. I started right here. Um, so let me number these as I add them in. Or maybe the numbers are too confusing. I'll, I'll put letters on them. Um, so I started here like that. Now what am I going to add next? Um, notice that I have this nice weight 5 edge, but that doesn't seem like a good one to add because it would make a cycle that would be kind of wasteful. I already have A and C connected. Uh, and instead, the next edge I'm going to add is going to be this one with weight 8 to go up here. So I'll call this node D. And then from there, I'm going to add this weight 6 edge that goes to what I'll call node E. And then finally, I'll add this weight 4 edge to go to the last node right here, F. And so you can see that the uh, spanning tree I end up with, it's a, it's a spanning tree because it touches every node once. And um, what's the total weight? Is 3 plus 4 plus 8 plus 6 plus 4, which I think is 25. And I wrote 24, but I said 25. Okay. Yeah. So that's, that's the total weight of this, and you can confirm. I challenge you to come up with anything which has a smaller weight. In fact, this is a minimum spanning tree. So if you were careful, then you maybe figured out that what the strategy I was doing is that at each step along the way, I'm adding the weight, the, the edge which is connected to what I have so far. So connected to what I have so far, which doesn't make a cycle, so doesn't go back to a node I've already touched and where the next edge has the least weight. So like I started here and I was just saying, what's the least weight edge from this node was four. So that's where I, that's what I took first. Then I said, okay, now I have A and B. What's the least weight edge out of either of those is going to be this weight three edge up to the next node, which I called C. And now I want to say out of these three, what's the least weight edge connected to any of those? So we have like 10, five, eight. Well, the five is the least weight, except that would make a cycle. So that's kind of out of the running. And so then the, the next least was uh, this edge here of weight 8 to go up to the next node of D, and then on and on like that. And so that's what's called Prim's algorithm. Um, so the here's, here's another description of it. You can start at any vertex. It does not matter where you start. I chose to start at the left-hand side, but I could have started anywhere else. And actually, you would get the same, at least the same weight tree if you started at any one of these nodes. I encourage you to try that if you don't believe me. Um, and then what we do is we just add the least weight edge from the tree you have so far, which goes to the rest of the graph. So what this means to the rest of the graph, meaning um, not back into T, into the, the tree that we have so far. So that's what's gonna avoid um, accidentally creating a cycle. And at each step, we're going to add one more edge and one more vertex to our tree until we have um, n minus 1 edges and n vertices, and that means that we're done. And it turns out that that actually works. So now, um, what the next question we should be asking is, like, why does this actually work, and, and what's the underlying strategy here? So we're not going to answer both of those questions in today's video, but what I want to go back to is, um, is a discussion of what is the general idea behind this algorithm? Oh, sorry, and before I do that, uh, I want to answer this question down here. So what does this remind you of? This should remind you of Dijkstra's algorithm. It's just like Dijkstra's, except um, it's actually simpler than Dijkstra's. Because in Dijkstra's algorithm, what determines the next edge that we consider is the total distance from the starting point including that new edge. Um, so in Dijkstra's algorithm, whenever you're adding things to the heap, you're always like adding up the weight of the current edge plus the weights of the previous thing. Um, so the difference from Dijkstra's here is that there's no addition. When we consider uh, which edge to go to next, we just consider the weight of that one edge itself. We're not, we don't really care about the total distance from A. Notice that the the total distance from A to F in this tree is pretty far. We could have probably find, found a shorter way. If we wanted to just get from A to F, we could go straight across like uh, at total distance 17 instead of this, this whole tree, which has weight 25.
But the goal isn't shortest paths here. The goal is to touch every node and connect them all with its um, least total weight. And so that's why when we run this, and this is like you would use the same data structures, you get the same running time, and everything is Dijkstra's algorithm. It's just that the the choices work differently because we're not adding up like the total distance. We're just considering the single edge weights. Okay, so what's the underlying strategy here? And that'll be the last thing we talk about today is, uh, as you may have figured out, this is a, a classic example of a greedy algorithm. So what does a greedy algorithm mean? Um, well, a greedy algorithm, first of all, is going to be something that has to do with an optimization problem. So where there's many possible solutions, but we want to find the very best one. Uh, so we've seen a lot of examples of this already. So like shortest path problems and graphs, um, change making. So uh, change with the least number of coins. We saw a lot of these things with dynamic programming, like the, um, the best uh, pyramid path for uh, Qbert, uh, the edit distance. Right, there's many ways to change one word into another word. And for the edit distance problem, we were saying, what's the least number of changes that we could make in order to do it? Um, and of course, minimum spanning tree is another example of uh, where there may be many kind of trees that could cover all the nodes, but we want to find the one with the least total weight. And so there's, there's many examples of optimization problems. And one observation is that a lot of times we can break down the optimal solution into a series of decisions. So like the shortest path is kind of taking one edge at a time. Making change with coins is doing one coin at a time. Doing the path down the pyramid for Qbert is doing one step down at a time. Edit distance is one change at a time. Okay, you get the idea. And so a greedy algorithm is that we make these moves, we make these choices without looking ahead. So the, the word greedy is the, is the correct one to use. That's the technical word. This is a computer science class. Like you should know what a greedy algorithm is. And this is what people talk about. In my head, I think a better thing to remember of what greedy really means. Um, Cause I don't know, maybe because when I learned about this, like uh, my more, something about my, my religious upgrade bringing, like maybe think like greedy is all that's like a sin. And like, I don't know, I had all this weird hangouts with it, but I think that the word greedy here really you can think of as short-sighted so what is this design paradigm is that instead of like think about the edit distance problem where we make this whole uh dynamic programming table that is not a greedy algorithm that's computing all these different options in a sophisticated way and then really reconstructing what's the best path a greedy algorithm for edit distance would be like as soon as i see two letters different i just change one into the other one I don't think about do I want to add or remove, I just, I just do it. I just make the decision without thinking ahead of what the future consequence is going to be. So the, um, that's the idea of a greedy algorithm, is to solve an optimization problem by like picking the best next thing to add to the solution at every step. Um, and it, it'll work, so it's going to be fast to compute, and hopefully it gives us a feasible solution, but it might not always be optimal. Um, and so let's, uh, I have a couple of movie quotes for us to think about this. Um, so this first one is from the movie Wall Street with Michael Douglas. And uh, there's this famous speech where he says like greed is good. And that's some kind of a um, meme from that movie. And I would, I would actually modify this to say that greed is not always good. Not necessarily. That's what we have to prove. So the big problem with greedy algorithms and the, and the main point I would like you to take away from today is that we can come up with a greedy algorithm, but it might not always be the um, give us the optimal solution. So I would rather say like greed is fast. Greed is, is cheap, right? If we have a greedy solution, it's going to quickly come up with some answer, but we don't know if it's the best one. So a good uh, additional movie quote to have in mind is this from uh, the classic uh, movie training day with uh, Denzel is uh, it's not what you know, it's what you can prove, right? Um, so just because you have an algorithm and it seems to work and you might have it working on examples. And so let me write this down as clearly as I can. Examples are not enough. Examples are a good start 
to convincing yourself that a greedy algorithm works, but you actually have to prove it. So the really hard thing about greedy algorithms is usually not getting them to run fast, but actually saying, how do you know that it is always going to give the optimal solution? How do you know that this short-sighted series of short-sighted decisions is going to end up with this optimal thing at the end of the day? And it's very, very easy to come up with greedy algorithms, which um, seem to be good, but actually for some weird input, they, they give you the, a suboptimal solution. And the counting change problem is a good example of that. So if you remember this um, change problem that we looked at for a puzzle, what we saw is that it depends on the denominations. If we have uh, coins that are like 1, 5, 10, and 25, then, okay, what's the greedy algorithm for counting change? Is that you always just like take the largest, keep taking um, the largest that you can. So if I'm trying to make 71 cents, I would just pick as many quarters as I can to and then pick as many dimes as I can, and then as many nickels, etc. And so that actually works. The greedy algorithm works to give you optimal solutions, the least number of coins with our US coin denominations. But if we have some other weird numbers like 1, 7, 17, and 23, then actually that greedy algorithm of just always taking the largest might not always give you the best way. So like I think in this example, if we have like 34 cents, if I start by choosing 23, now I have to make up 11 with seven and four ones. Whereas you can see a better way to make 34 is just two 17 cent coins. Um, and so this is a good example where like this example would make it seem like, oh man, this greedy sol solution for counting, for getting change with the least number of coins is always great. Except if we change that input a little bit, turns out the greedy algorithm doesn't work there. Um, and so this is an example of a greedy algorithm, which is not always optimal. And so we need to be skeptical of ourselves when we're coming up with greedy solutions, optimal. Um, when we're coming up with greedy solutions, we have to be constantly thinking about, can I actually prove that this is gonna work perfectly? So I'm not gonna prove that Prim's algorithm is perfect for the minimum spanning tree problem yet. You'll have to wait till the next video for that. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to tell you about in terms of not trusting ourselves is that I thought both of these movie memes were from 90s movies. And so I wanted to make a comment about that. And it turns out that it is very easy to be wrong. This one is from 1987 and this one is from 2001. Um, so greedy algorithms can be fast, but don't just trust your own judgment. You actually have to prove things and make sure you have it right. Listen to Denzel, not to Michael Douglas. And that's all for today. Thanks.